Any questions, additions, or anything? Councillor Simons? I have an item for other business. Mr. Commissioner, please. Okay. One for other, for Councillor Simons, please. <coughs> Seeing no others, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, declaration of pecuniary interest at the time. Uh, there is one delegation that it will not be here, the OPP, and we do have Chris Prentice here from IBI Group Transit Feasibility Study. Mr. Prentice, please come forward to the uh, podium. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee. Uh, my pleasure to be here to tell you about the work we've done up to now to try and assess what the opportunities and needs are for more extensive public transit service within the county. Um, I trust you've probably seen our extensive report uh, that we've submitted, so what I'd like to do here, rather than go into all that detail, is give you obviously the, the Coles Notes version, uh, really get to the basic points, and then be happy to answer any of your questions that you might have. Um, just make sure. Uh, very quickly, um, the study was conducted in two phases. Phase one really being an intention to give you an overview, a summary of what the needs are and what some of the possible answers might be, but not giving you, frankly, uh, what the solutions are at this point. That's really phase two, but we wanted to give you an idea of what the need is and some concept of, of what that might mean dollars and cents wise. That gives you then an opportunity to say whether you want to proceed to phase two or not, which would then be to, to flesh out the, the actual, what the services would look like and what the costs would be. But what we've really concentrated on doing is trying to look at what the demand is um, and, and what that might look like in terms of existing uh, of new services and also what to do with your existing STP service. So we've phase one now completed and that's what I'm presenting to you on. Um, the study purpose just to maintain the focus was obviously determine what the need is and then based on that what's the feasibility of introducing a service? Is it needed? What would it look like? Um, what's practical? Who would use it? And, and what might be some of the cost parameters involved? Um, so what we're really doing is identifying potential services based on those needs as people have expressed to it and to us and they've expressed it to us through a wide range of stakeholder consultation methods that I'll talk about in just a moment um, and keeping in mind that not one service perhaps will fit all needs obviously uh, I mean the characteristics of the county as you know are are not like one small municipality for example uh, or co cohesive uh, municipality such as for example Branford down the road you are much uh, broader much uh, more complex than that if I may say that even though it's small in numbers perhaps so we need to design something that's going to meet best meet the needs of the county um, so as I said, phase two phases, we're now at the end of phase one, and what we've done up to this point to get to where we are is extensive stakeholder consultation, as I said a moment ago, and that consisted of doing surveys, both telephone service, surveys, which are very targeted and focused, where we phoned 500 people, talked to them on the phone, asked them a whole range of questions, dealing with what their travel habits are, their, their, their age and, and uh, what their needs are, got their opinions. We then had web-based surveys through the, the county's website and hard copy of those services available or surveys available at your offices and we got all of that back. Talked to key opinion leaders, I interviewed mem many members of council. Uh, we talked to some of the private sector people, some of the business people. Uh, we met with the uh, transportation task force group as well. So a very wide range and we reviewed previous work that had been done by the county's transportation task force. So we took that all into account. We then did a peer review. We looked at the transit services that exist in 17 comparable Ontario communities. Now when I say comparable, of course, every municipality is, is different, such as the county, but still, it gives you a sense of what's going on <coughs> elsewhere so that we can then say to you, 
you know, based on what goes on elsewhere, here's what you can expect. We're not just dreaming something up, but rather we're basing it on facts. So that's really the value of doing a peer review. Then out of that, we looked at what the market and what the demand analysis would be. Uh, demographic growth, we looked at the future growth in the county uh, and what those travel trends looked like. We also reviewed your existing uh, subsidized transportation uh, program service because that represents a pretty significant transportation service today. So we had a critical review of that to see what its strengths and weaknesses are. How would it then play out in future? Would it uh, form the basis of some new service going forward? Uh, and as part of that, we also uh, talked with your taxi bylaw people to have a look at what the, the taxi bylaw does, the performance of existing taxi operators, and what issues there are there. So we tried to be very comprehensive in what we're doing. And then last but not least, what we've, out of all of that information we've, we've uh, gathered and, and took to heart and digested, uh, we've identified some potential service concept options and what they may look like and what some of the implications of them would be. And I'll get to those in just a moment. Um, the background, uh, you know, I'm sure years ago there was a service between Paris and Brantford. That ceased to be uh, when, the, when the province uh, withdrew its transit funding back many years ago. And not much has been done since except you got into the subsidized transportation program which was uh, essentially a, a uh, using the taxi operators and it's a subsidized taxi service for those who uh, qualify based on good criteria that your, your staff have developed and you have approved over the years. Um, the profile, currently you're 30, 34,000, um, concentrated primarily Paris and St. George, as you well know, with a bit in, in Burford. The main growth areas are going to be here, St. George, and perhaps in Burford. So fairly, fairly focused around where things are today. Um, you do have an aging rural population, as, as all of you know. Uh, which represents increasing isolation, so there's that kind of a need out there. Um, county profile, uh, median age 40, uh, fairly high, 27% um, over 55, which just emphasizes that whole seniors element and the need for uh, some alternatives. Two-thirds of the population work outside the county. Uh, significant percent travel outside for medical, health, education, social services, uh, shopping. There's a fair bit of travel within the, the town here, the town of Paris. Um, so that means something as well. The major destination outside the county really is, uh, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, is Brantford. Uh, lesser so out to uh, Hamilton for medical and, and education purposes, but it's really that key magnet is, is Brantford. Um, and as I said earlier, we, we did a extensive consultation uh, with stakeholders. I said, sorry, I said 500, 450. Our target was to get 500 residents, but we ended up with 450 only because, quite frankly, uh, the, uh, the responses we got were quite good, very extensive, and, and ate up more time. So they only ended up doing about 450 instead of 500. Still, very valid way to understand what the needs are. We then had 471 online and hard copy surveys. So together, over 1,000 responses, which frankly for a population of 34,000 is significant, is very good. Um, I've, I've done studies in, in municipalities of twice the population of the county and we've had a third of that kind of response. So I think it just tells you the, the interest that there is. Um, so the most popular out of all of this, what we learned is nothing, again, radical uh, or surprising, I don't think, and it just reinforces where the real needs are. Most popular travel linkages are Burford to Paris, Paris to Burford, you know, the two-way flow. Paris to St. George, St. George to Paris, there is that linkage there, trips within Paris. Now, that's just within the county. Outside the county, there are also St. George to Brantford, Paris to Brantford. Not so much Burford, but a bit Burford to Brantford, but the key ones are from here and from St. George to Brantford. Um, the peer review, just briefly to tell you about that, as I said, we looked at 17 
uh, Ontario communities, typically the services that they have, and, and you keep in mind that they're fairly urban municipalities, even though we tried to look at those that had some characteristics like the county, but there aren't that many out there. Uh, but most of them have a fixed route type of service where they focus all of their service on that, where the bus runs back, just like in Brantford, on fixed routes, regular schedules, six or seven, eight days a week. Uh, you have the Norfolk County, uh, or County of Norfolk style, uh, where they have a fixed route, but they go to different destinations every day of the week, but focused on Simcoe. So there's that kind of idea. So they provide, uh, you know, sort of a regular type of service within Simcoe, but then linked to those other communities that they serve uh, every other day during the week. So there's that style. There's also the style that's just started up in um, Innisfil Beach, uh, where they've used Uber. But keeping in mind that Uber really is just a technology uh, for booking and billing, uh, and if any of you have used that service, what they're doing is trying to use that to test what the demand is. Uh, I can tell you, while uh, and, and there's different degrees of success, um, it's working, uh, it's serving some needs, but what they're finding already is that there's not enough people that are volunteering, because it's up to you and I, for example, to offer to be an Uber driver. They just don't come up with the Uber drivers themselves. It's up to us to do that. And they're finding a limitation on that already. Uh, and Innisfil is about the same size as the county, 30, 35,000. Um, so that's, that's an interesting comparator. Uh, and we've taken that into account. We're looking at that and keeping an eye on it as it progresses. But out of everything that we've seen, when we look at all of these services that the other municipalities provide and the level of use that comes out of it, it comes out to about an average of, on an annual basis, every uh, man, woman, and child in the county using transit service about 2.5 times a year. So what you do is you count up the number of trips, you divide by the population, and that gives you what is known as passengers per capita. Now, it ranges from a low of 0.5 up to 11, but that's kind of where it is. So for looking at the potential demand in the county, that's the kind of figure that we're sort of looking at. So, and that's taking the total population, not dividing it down by Paris and St. George, which we have done, but just looking at it. So that's your perspective, and that's the kind of information that we've got from uh, what's going on elsewhere. Now, the uh, market and demand analysis, as I said, we went through all of that to look at what might work. Um, when you add in the fact that there's already 10,400 trips annually on your STP program, which isn't insignificant, we think that overall uh, about 53,500 trips could be taken on a, uh, depending on what the service looks like, but that's about the potential ridership in the county in a year. 53,590, and that's basing it on sort of conservative efforts, or estimates, I should say, and most would occur in Paris, St. George, and Burford. Very little out in the rest of the county, only because of how low dense it is and, and the lower population out in those areas. So in a sense, it's not enough to justify a single regular fixed route anywhere, but rather something of a blend of various ideas. And that's where we come down to the service concept alternatives. Um, as a fundamental part, and this differentiates the need from what you're doing today with your STP, there's a need, there is a definite need from what we've heard. People are saying they can't get around, they're increasingly isolated, they want to get back and forth, they don't want to drive, there's a lot of people that can't drive, but there's also a lot of people who don't want to drive, so they want an alternative. Um, and what you have today is just a, a single ride taxi type service. What we have to get into for sustainability and for cost efficiency is what is known as a shared ride uh, public service, which also meets the, the specialized transit needs for people with disabilities. That's kind of what STP has been focusing on up till now, but it needs to be broadened from there. So service could include the following elements that we would pursue in phase two if you decide to pursue, go to phase two. We could look at some type of fixed route, perhaps on the uh, Norfolk County model, um, or getting into flex zones, which are illustrated in this 
illustration diagram there where you have these zones that are identified and, and a vehicle operates within those zones connecting people, focusing on either Brantford or Paris itself. Um, so it could be a combination of those kind of things, using small capacity vehicles, something more than just a uh, perhaps a taxi, depending on the demand as it evolves. Um, what we want to do is, that we're suggesting is that you develop something that is scalable. In other words, you start small and build as demand warrants. Don't jump in with operating, for example, a big bus operating on a route all over the place because, A, that's expensive, um, and also what happens if it doesn't work. So we, our suggestion is you start small, <coughs> scale it, build up. We're talking about another suggestion is a countywide e-hailing service. That is similar to the, the Uber style uh, of operation, but really what it is, it's demand-based, uh, subsidized microtransit or on-demand on -demand, uh, ride hailing, shared ride. And the, and the point there is that it isn't just a trip for one person, but rather you want to combine together more than one people, one person, to, sh to have them share the ride and take them to multiple destinations. That's what's different compared to your STP today. Uh, and that is, you need that to try and not only serve more people, but also to be more efficient in your operation. Um, and that's one of the conclusions that we had in looking at the STP is that really isn't sustainable in the long run. Uh, not only because the fare, quite frankly, is high, it's $8 or $10 depending on the distance traveled for the user, but also it's single trip and that's an expensive thing to do and it's using up all of the resources of your, of your taxi operators. So we want to go beyond that. Um, so that brings us then really to number four, which is sort of a, a hybrid of the STP, where you, where you scale up the STP service to accommodate the general public, get into the shared ride, use the flex zone, uh, and then have a fare policy that perhaps is, is uh, multiple in that it serves and meets the needs for short trips as well as the longer trips that you have. So that's the, the basic concepts. Um, just to give you an idea of, of some cost so that you can sort of understand where, where things may be going. If we got into something like a, uh, a fixed route, which has been talked about all the time. We did you know, the, the transit, major transit study for Brantford and quite frankly service to Paris came up quite a lot in that review. Um, and I don't want to speak for Brantford, but certainly they're a potential partner with you to, to help provide a service, but if you wanted to get into running a route just between Paris and Brantford, operating at 12 hours a day, six to seven days a week, that first bullet there shows you it would cost about $300,000 a year just to operate that one service. Um, if you wanted to add a St. George to Brantford type service, even operating just a couple of days a week, you're going to add another $60,000. So it starts to add up when you look at all of those things. And what are we getting out of it? We're getting a very small market and we're leaving the rest of the county not well served. So we want to look at, again, something that, that would help serve all of the county, but also meet the needs of some of the key travel patterns, which is the Paris, Brantford, Burford, Paris, St. George, Brantford, St. George, Paris as well. But I'm just showing you that to give you a sense of what the dollar amount is. Now, I should also mention, today, you are investing in the STP about $121,000, I think it is, Leslie, yeah, annually on that, plus staff, staff time, um, about one of your staff people spend about half of their time administering the STP program right now. Uh, so if you add that kind of cost in, you're probably in the $150,000, $160,000 range of investment. Um, so that's, that's sort of an, a, a background. And looking to the future then, we would see using advanced booking, e-hailing technology, perhaps multi-fare, uh, flex zones, all of that sort of stuff. And to launch the service, uh, you'd, we'd 
say that you do it by getting into an RFP uh, where you solicitor, solicit uh, contractors, people to come in through a competitive process to operate that service as you define it. And then build into a contract with them performance measurement standards. So that helps you not only monitor how that contractor performs, but then ultimately gives you the basis for judging how well the service is performing and at some point down the road, you look at it, review it, and say, all right, is it meeting our original expectations? And if it is, great. If it isn't, then you say, okay, we need to make some changes. And you base it on that pre-established criteria. So it gives you good management control. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of other issues that you'd look at as part of it, launching any kind of a expanded public transit service, uh, getting into not just staff, but vehicles. Uh, do you buy them? Do you lease them? Do you have a contractor supply them? And it could be any of those. Infrastructure, if you got into a, a fixed route service, by the way, you're into fairly significant stop in infrastructure. Uh, not only just putting the pole and the sign to say it's a bus stop, but you ultimately have to make them accessible. Uh, for people with mobility devices. Um, obviously, you've got to market and promote any service that you provide. And the budget, budget implications out of that are operating costs, the capital costs for perhaps buying vehicles. Um, you know, a great big a bus that Brantford buys, by the way, is about $500,000. The smaller ones that are used for the uh, the Brantford lift service are about $90,000, just as a comparator. There are some that are about 120, so that gives you a sense of, of what those vehicles cost. Revenue, clearly the main revenue would be fare, fares, um, and that could be set based on the service type. Now, funding. One good, a big good news item that I know you are already aware of is that uh, the county does qualify for provincial gas tax. Uh, as a result of the STP service you provide now. And as the county invests further in transit, if that's what you decide to do, and as use of that transit service increases in future, you can qualify for more provincial funding as a result of that. So that's a good thing. Um, and the county will already start receiving that gas tax now. It can be banked and used in the future to help fund services and it can be used for either capital uh, acquisitions or anything like that or for operating. So you can augment what you're spending today. Uh, on the legal side, there's a few things that related to the, Ameri uh, to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, AODA, human rights, all that in terms of making the vehicles accessible and the service accessible. Most of that you're complying with already today with the STP. So that's the, that's the uh, Coles Notes version of what we've done, what we found out, and what our message is. The real conclusions are that a more extensive public transit service is needed in the county. We feel it's feasible, depending on the style of service that, we, uh, that you approve and we bring back to you. The STP service is at capacity. It's not sustainable going forward. Uh, as the county grows and ages, there's going to be increased demand for transit service. Key principles, some things that you might want to think about uh, when you look at what's, do we get into a real public transit service? You know, you look at what the community needs are. What are the expectations? Uh, ridership, we've given you a little bit of an idea of how many people would use it. Accessibility, you need to make it accessible. Cost, giving you a bit of a ballpark idea there. Implementation through an RFP process. So, all of that is to say, there is a need. There's strong uh, support for public transit in the county based on the feedback we've got. There are service options out there. Phase two, so it's really your decision now to decide, okay, we've heard, we've got a sense of what the need is, what, what we might be getting into cost-wise, that we want to move to phase two. And in phase two, what we will bring back to you is the actual, here's the, with all those concepts we've talked about, we'll come back to, with, to you with the package of what those services would be, the cost of them, how they'd be implemented, and all of the support stuff that goes with it. But really, it's a, at this point, we wanted to tell you where we are, and that is that there is a need, there are some choices, um, and that based on others, 
something is needed in the county. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Prentice. Are there any questions, Councillor Pierce? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, thanks very much for that presentation. Um, yes, sir. I agree, definitely. We need something, and, mm. and what it is, I, I think we can we can kind of take from the information we got here and build something. Now, a couple of things that I, I, I noticed on there. You talked about the one between, um, the, just the one I picked up on, was between Brantford and Paris, 12 hours a day, six yeah. to seven days a week. Um, I've got several friends that, you know, they take a taxi cab back and forth to Brantford because that's where they work. Um, was there any thought of potentially, you know, a 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m. bus going to Brantford, a 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m. bus coming back? Because as you alluded to before, and I think, you know, the reality of it is why the bus is left is to your point, you can't have a bus with three or four people on it yeah. going to Brantford. So I'm curious, you know, was there any discussion around, you know, potentially starting it off with, you know, for the, for the, the, the commuters going back and forth to work, a morning going to Paris, or sorry, a morning going to Brantford, an afternoon coming back to Paris. Um, that was the one thing I picked up. And then uh, up there you had $3 fare. Yeah. I know to take a taxi to Brantford is like 20 bucks. So I'm thinking, yeah. you know, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's out of line to be, you know, five or seven or even $10 for, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to go $10, but I'm thinking yeah. definitely more than three, I don't think would be, you know, um, too hard to, to swallow, which mm -hmm. would increase your, you got 61,000 coming back or something like that, which would increase that. Yeah. So um, the only other, the only other thing I'm, I, I have a question about, you talked about the e-hailing. So if somebody, if somebody were to do that, now obviously we want multiples and that, cause that makes sense to do it that way. So if somebody in Burford calls up and they want to, they want to go from Burford to St. George, let's say, um, but they're the only one that wants to do that. Would that still take place or would it, would they be kind of on a hold until there's somebody else in the Burford area that wants to come this way? Um, if I could take, I think, four questions there and, and um, try and answer each of them. Um, some of them, some of the answers I'm afraid are part of phase two, which we'd come back to you. But to ask your first one about, you know, a route between here and Brantford, uh, should it be just in the morning and <coughs> the evening, that kind of thing. Uh, we looked at, you know, we considered that. I only provided uh, that 12 hour service and that costing only because that's sort of the typical service that's provided elsewhere, just to give you a perspective of okay. what that might cost. Yes, the idea being that it doesn't need to be that way, you know, every hour, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. We can scale it again to, to start to serve. The one, I think the one caution and the one thing I would say to you going into any further is that public transit's not going to serve everybody's needs, particularly in a small, low-density community. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got to set your expectations realistically. And someone who goes to work at 6 o'clock in the morning in, in the industrial park in Bradford, sorry, we not, may not be able to serve them. It, it may be someone coming from Paris. What about someone from Burford? You're not going to be able to do all that, A, because you just cost prohibitive to right, do otherwise. Right. Even in big cities, they have trouble meeting the diverse needs. So I, I just put that caution to you as you go forward, or think about going forward. Uh, but yes, we could scale, start off, yes, a few trips here and there each day, um, like the Ride Norfolk model, for example, is that uh, you know every day of the week, perhaps, you link Paris with Brantford, but maybe you pull in Burford and then St. George and, and uh, whatever else. So that's what we would come back with you, trying to give you a service design that way. Uh, the $3 fare that you asked about, I only use $3 as an example because that's what it is in, in Brantford and that's what it is in most of the other communities, to give you an example. Certainly, council, you know, in, in its wisdom from this committee can set whatever fare they wish. Um, but recognizing that there is a balance between the fare you charge and the number of people that are going to use the service. Absolutely. We did test in the survey, ask people what they would pay for a service, not knowing what the service was, so it was a difficult question to answer, but we gave them a range up to $5, and there were people that thought 5 would be okay. Most of them came back with 3 but still, I think that was coincidental, because down the road, it's, it's $3. Right. Um, the question of, of someone in Burford, I think you said, uh, phoning up. Uh, the idea would be to have multiple riders 
and when those services would operate. Yes, it's possible that just one person might be on that trip, if you will, okay. but the idea would be is that we, we set specific trip times when the service would be available, so when that person phones up, that they're ideally not the only one. Oh, okay. But My that's what we'd be doing. It's not just a wide open, okay. anytime you want it, it would be set by specific times when the service would be available. Okay, I, right? I, mis I misunderstood okay. that then. That's perfect. Now, Thank you. I'm sorry, my memory's good, but sometimes short. Was there a fourth question there? I thought there were many. No, I think, you covered, it, I think you covered it off pretty well. Thank you very much. Right. Appreciate it. Okay. That. Any other questions? Councilor Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, three questions um, through you to Mr. Preston. Really good report, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I, did, I hope I distilled it <laughs> fairly well for you. Would, would all our reports be this good? I think we'd be quite happy. Um, okay, three questions. First question, those five options you showed us. Uh, okay, let me just go back STP, to them. Um, you know, the regular routes. Those, are are those they, ones? Yeah, are they all eligible for the provincial gas tax? Yes. Okay. Yes, they would be. On the proviso that, and you may have heard this already, um, on the proviso that it's not a demonstration yes, service. Yes, a pilot project. Not a pilot project, not a demonstration. In other words, council would have to say, we're getting into this, and, and that's why I was mentioning about performance measurement criteria. In other words, you're going into it fully committed, we're gonna run this service for however long, forever. But what you do have is you have performance measurement criteria and after a couple of years you review the service and if it isn't measuring up then you make some decisions about what to do with it. But still, the main principle is, yeah, we're doing it and then you'll qualify for the gas tax. Okay. Uh, second question then, um, uh, you, when you showed us uh, you know, the cost and these are the revenues, the biggest revenue being the fares generated, um, compared to fares, how's um, How's uh, sales and stuff like that? You know what I mean? Where you put the big signs advertising somebody on the sides of the buses. Is, is that a significant component or is no? No, it's not. And, and frankly, it has declined. Even in the systems that have them and have had fairly extensive advertising, it's declined over the years. As a matter of fact, if you, if you travel to some other communities, you'll see, for example, shelters that don't even have ads in them. The whole advertising community is changing. It's going to, you know, your online, yeah. online stuff, um, that kind of thing. Established communities such as the Torontos, um, I mean, Brantford still has reasonably good advertising, but for there, they can at least appeal to a fairly uh, dense and, and frequent level of, of commuters and things like that that will read the signs. In a smaller community like this, no. You won't get that. That doesn't mean you, you couldn't and shouldn't if you have shelters out there, because there still are some in Paris that remain from the old service from 20 years ago, um, or try and put something on buses. That would be a nice thing, but it's not going to be very much. I would, I would guess at the most it would be a couple of thousand dollars in a year. Okay. All right. And then the, the third question then. Um when you do a phase two, you're going to look. You're going to show costs, I guess. Oh, indeed. And, and you show the the outlay. This is what we spend. Um, this is what it costs. Those are the hard costs, I guess. How how do you um, or do you or should you um, account for those other costs? And I'll give you an example. Um, if a family doesn't need a second car, they can save. Oh. It's somewhere in the right range of ten thousand dollars a year, give or take. Um, if somebody um, doesn't make their medical appointment, for example, uh, maybe there's added costs because they have to go to the hospital now, or you know what I mean, or somebody gets to a job or, or can get a job now, you know what I mean? How do you account for that, or can you, or should you, you know? Thank you. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, Councillor Miller was on the Transportation Task Force and he raised that question. Uh, it's quite a good one. Basically, it's the residual benefits of having public transit. Uh, what does it do for the community? Uh, because it isn't just a benefit, as, as the councillor is suggesting, and I, I'm sure all of you feel this way, I hope, um, that having a transit service doesn't just benefit the people that would maybe use it, but it has a broader benefit to the community, both in terms of image, economic development, retention, uh, because many communities that don't have public transit service or have lost it, people have moved out of the community to go to somewhere that does have public transit. So there's a wide range of benefits. 
we would, yes, we'd try and bring that value as part of the equation. It is difficult to measure. Uh, it's more of a, it's almost more of a gut feel. Um, but uh, we will try and put some dollar value to that and bring it to you. Uh, as I said, there's, I'm not aware of that, of studies that have actually quantified what that is, other than we know that communities have said having public transit means a lot and it has those benefits in those areas that I mentioned. But we'll certainly try and put some value to that, okay? If I may, Mr. Chairman, that's so the best I can answer on that one. It's, it's, it's one that has been asked an awful lot. I have to admit, I've asked it many, many times. I've tried to quantify it because I talk to people when we do these sort of studies and just, and, and, or regular transit studies and say, you know, what's the value of transit to the community? And it's a lot, but it's, it's not like having a, um, a festival that you can say, geez, you know, we had 50,000 people come into the, and it contributed a million dollars to the local economy. Um, there is something like that involved with public transit, but there's no real equations out there. But we'll try and do that. Sorry, no, I'm Councilor Gatward, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to um, Chris, thank you for that presentation. And did I read in your report somewhere that um, if all communities can't use this service, that it could be build on a per area basis um, to the various communities that are provided the service. Uh, maybe you, I'm trying to think, I don't know if it was in our report that we said that, but that is, whether or not, that is possible, yes. Um, for example, Hamilton, they still have what is known as area rating. Uh, where each of the municipalities, former municipalities that are now part of Hamilton, still have their area rating, Stony Creek, uh, that sort of thing. So they are billed for the amount of service that's, that's delivered in their area only. I have to admit, we did a study in Hamilton and highly recommended getting rid of that because it really, it really uh, fractures uh, the whole planning and, and approach to public transit. It should be the broad needs of the community rather than just individual. But that's a separate issue. To answer your question, yes, it's possible to do area. Thank, thank you for that. And the reason, um, you mentioned the hail of ride. Inhaling, yes. Um, would that be for only areas that you mentioned? Or say someone from Mount Pleasant or um, Middleport or Scotland wanted a, a ride to Brantford, can they e um, Yes, that's what we would come back to you with. Uh, for example, in this slide here with that illustration, we've generally shown a couple of areas that would tie in and be part of the e-hailing concept. Um, it would be, could be broader out in the rest of the county. Um, our thinking at this point is that you set one fare for those areas within, for example, those circles. It would have to be a higher fare outside of those circles just because of the distance involved and that sort of thing. So we're not ignoring the broader needs of the county as a whole, but you scale the service and scale the, the fares accordingly and also the availability of the service. So it may not be, as the previous question was asking, not every day, every hour, something's available. So you mentioned distance. What it, the further, the north uh, on the map there, with the circles, yes. do you know how far it is from the very furthest point? Glen in the north, top and circle? thereabouts. Yeah, from uh, there to, where, where do you consider the starting point? <laughs> would that be in your second it's, report? That, that really would be, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, because we've got to try and figure out exactly where the major demand would be and the population would be. And that's why it, this is just illustrative at this point, but we see St. George, Brantford, we see Paris, Brantford, and within Paris, Burford, and so forth um, coming in that way. We'd have to flesh all that sort of stuff out. 
Thank you. If you don't mind. It's, but all of those considerations are very much what we want to look at and bring back to you. Thank you. Councillor Powell, then Councillor Chambers. Through you, Mr. Chairman, to the presenter. The City of Brantford added a bus line or extended one in order to service Procter & Gamble. Big warehouse, a lot of employees. So there is a set time they come and go. Now, is it possible in Paris a factory or a warehouse like Adidas, again with a fair number of employees, could end up being your anchor in terms of customers and revenue. And then if you linked it in with Ferrero Rocher, you have another large factory, a lot of employees that, again, would have much the same service or need. And then if you linked it in with a run through downtown Paris and out again, but using those one or two factories to carry the heavy load of the, the numbers and the revenue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, uh, that would certainly be part of phase two. Um, and, but the short answer is in generally yes, could serve that way. But keeping in mind, I think the approach that we'd want you to be considering is starting small, build on the basis of demand, uh, keeping in mind that that kind of factory and employer that you're talking about very, you know, it depends on how many people are coming from even within the county, let alone places like Paris. Our experience is people are coming from all over. In Brantford, again, for that industrial park you're talking about, there's a lot of other employers there, and there's a fairly strong uh, contingent of workers who are coming from within Brantford, so that helps make that service very viable uh, from their standpoint. I think from our standpoint, your standpoint here in the county, what we'd want to do, and that's the whole point of, of demand response or e-hailing, is that we start, let that start to, um, to develop and demonstrate the need in time. Don't try and start doing everything right off the bat, but build towards that. So it could end up being that, yeah, you have a regular service every day going out there from, maybe it's just Paris, or broadly, based throughout the county going there. But that's something that we'd have to come up with in time. It's not something that we're able to come on and say, geez, yeah, you can do it today. Mm -hmm. Because our experience is, there's not a lot of people who would, would make that kind of service justifiable right off the bat. But again, it's part of building Thank you. scalability. Thank you, uh, Councillor Powell. Councillor Chambers, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I expect my question would be more suitable for phase two, but you might just want to comment in, in how I'm thinking about this. You indicated that obviously there, there's going to be a tax base subsidy on, on use. Yes. Uh, you're suggesting in the case of Hamilton, uh, you would recommend against area ratings. You said that the outerlying areas would perhaps pay more because of the distance, et cetera. So just intuitively, intuitively, what you're setting up is a situation where people in outer lying areas are subsidizing the inner areas and having to pay more for the service that they use because they live outside of the area that they're subsidies, subsidizing. And that, in my mind, is inherently unfair mm -hmm. to the people living outside of the areas who are not apt to be able to use the system in, an, in a similar manner and are actually being paid more, actually having to pay more and subsidizing just as much for everybody else. It seems unfair to me for the outerlying areas in a rural based transportation system. Comment. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I should clarify what, what I was referring to was what the fare would be, uh, that uh, not that they're subsidizing anyone else, but rather uh, because the cost to provide the service out to these far reaches of the county is far more expensive than closer in, uh, that they would pay a, a higher fare. Uh, there certainly wouldn't be subsidizing uh, the services within that may have lower fare at all. And as a matter of fact, it may well be the other way. But that's what I was meaning. It's not that it's only the fare. It's not that anyone else is subsidizing anything. It's just what the fare would be a little better, higher for the distance involved, that's all. Okay. 
Seeing no more questions, thank you, Mr. Prentice. My your pleasure, sir. Thank well you. well uh, presented uh, short version of that presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Members of committee, we have a, uh, that is the last item under presentations and delegations today. Um, 9B1 is the item. Would you like to deal with that item now? Members of committee, is that okay? Okay, then we'll move ahead with 9B1. And 9B1 is the phase one transportation study. Uh, Mr. Bradley has put this together. Recommendation, there is a recommendation there. Do we have a mover? Councillor Coleman, a seconder. Councillor Boma, any questions or concerns? We all know what the recommendation is. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Mr. Prentice, for your presentation again. Thank you. Mo Moving forward, adoption of the minutes from uh, December. Councillor Boma, Councillor Coleman. Questions? Councillor Gatward, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page five of the minutes, the second paragraph down, there's a couple of words missing. It says knowingly fails to submit the necessary applications, but what kind of applications? It should say necessary tree cutting applications. That's what I was speaking to that evening. And so I would request the clerk add tree cutting applications there so that anybody reading this six months from now would know or tomorrow Madam would know. Clerk, make that change. Thank you. You're welcome. Any others? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Business arising from those minutes. Seeing none, we'll move forward. Consent items. We have uh, consent items to be received. B1 through 12. Councillor Pierce? Councillor Boma, would anyone like any pulled or reviewed? Councillor Gatward, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Number um, 10 or 7B11, uh, Too Far, Too Fast Canada. I'm not sure who this organization is, but I agree with their philosophy about the government moving too fast on legalization of cannabis. I don't believe, Mr. Chair, that our police services across the province are ready for this on July 1st. And I think that the federal government does want to keep their promise, but they could easily make it the end of the year or sometime next year. And I don't think they take into consideration um, the um, extra work that they caused for municipalities. I know they gave the provinces more money, yet when I read the letter in here from the minister, um, I believe it was of municipal affairs, he said it looked like it was going to be um, tough for there to be enough money to go around for municipalities, and that's us, because we're going to have to enforce yep. all the laws and rules. So. I would support not having a cannabis for sale outlet in the County of Brant, and that's what this uh, motion is, or this group is asking for. And uh, so I would move it if I'm, I'm seeking a seconder that we support it. Councillor Boma. Uh, not to second it, but if I could clarify the. Um, the motion that we passed to not allow any retail outlets at council already, does that automatically end on July 1st or, or until council changes it? Because then this is unnecessary. That is a very good question. And I don't know who could answer that. Councillor Simons. Sure. I, I wanted just clarification. Did Councillor Gatward mean 
County of Brant or Brant County? Because to my knowledge, I don't think we have one in the County of Brant coming. It's Brantford. That's correct. So it's Brant County. So it's Brant County or County, Brant County that you're talking about right now, then not County of Brant. So, right? Well, our is a corporation of County of Brant. I just, I'm just for clarification. Yeah. That's all. I just because we don't have one coming to the county at this point. Well, and we can't speak for the city either. So, well, they've said it's coming. No. Province has said Brantford is one of the spots. So I would, I would assume that it would be uh, the County of Brant. Councillor Miller, seconds, it's on the table. Further discussion? Councillor Pierce, then Councillor Chambers, and Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So through you, uh, just for clarity myself here and, and for <laughs> where Will was going there, like, can we get, like we, we passed a, a resolution and we got a bylaw and that was passed that we, you know, there will not be any in the county. Like, does that not stand firm? That's one, it's one of our bylaws. That, that mean anything? So I would suggest that that would keep going, right? Whether it's legalized I, or not. What I would suggest, Councillor, is we as a council have done that. Yes. However, when this changes and comes into uh, your worship, what do they call that? When it comes into uh, play but, or when it's, it's approved or gets into, passes through the house, I guess. It's already passed. It will come, up, come into effect. The date it comes into effect. I would suggest that it be something that our solicitor would have to look at because I don't know if we can, you know, I don't know if we, as a council, after that date, if we have a right to do that or not. I don't know. And I don't know if, if, if our uh, CAO or deputy CAO could even give well, a comment a, on that. Yeah, I'd say it's a legal matter. Yes, I would say so. Oh, right. Really? What is, I, don't I don't know who over. I don't know who supersedes who. That's the problem. Province does. The province over it's supersedes us. So. Yes. a license to somebody for that. Right. I think we'd be hard Press. put to prevent it. Prevent it. Yeah. So yeah. if somebody if somebody obtains a license, your worship, to sell after that date, we would be hard pressed to be able to stop that. So yeah, that's why it would become a legal issue at that time. Uh, wow. To take the bylaw. Councillor Chambers. Can't enforce it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to support the resolution because, in my mind, it's a meaningless resolution. The, uh, we can express an opinion, and, and that's all this resolution is. The way to regulate cannabis outlets is through land use planning. And our documents on, uh, with regard to land use planning may have to be uh, modified if it's the feeling that we do not want uh, legal cannabis outlets to be an authorized use in any particular zone. You can do that through land use planning and then you're subject to uh, appeals. But establishing a resolution declaring that we're not willing is really a, point. It's, it's a meaningless resolution and that encumbers any that? land use planning uh, analysis and uh, uh, it goes through the process and we don't even know what the regulations are yet so it's a it's a premature resolution that really is saying nothing and I've always said that uh, there's no sense supporting resolutions that are not applicable to anything Councillor Gatworth and Councillor Boma thank you uh, mr. chairman well Earlier today, we received a um, news release from the Ontario Provincial Police and the Holiday Ride Program. Um, they uh, charged over 500 drivers with impaired driving in the holiday season. Um, people don't get the message, don't drink and drive. And this is going to be a huge concern when it's legalized because people this stays in your system a lot longer than alcohol. Mm -hmm. And we've discussed this at length at the Impaired and Distracted Driving Committee, which I sit on, and they are very concerned about this new legislation. So 
I just felt it was important for us to send a message to the province and as Councillor Chambers said, certainly we can use our planning and our zoning to put these stores in the appropriate places, but provincial legislation does trump our legislation and we are at their mercy. But if everybody's silent and says nothing, then, then they think we're all happy. And, and we're not, because we're not getting any revenue from this other than maybe new buildings to grow this stuff. That's my... Thank you, and I, and, and, I, and I would believe that the AMO is all over this to begin with anyways, because I'm sure there's a lot of communities that uh, have done the same thing. Go ahead, uh, <laughs> Councillor Boma, please. Um, thank you. Uh, through you, of the clerk, if I may, um, on page 118 of our agenda, um, at the top, there's number 20, and I was just wondering if that applies here because I've, I've seen differences between how we do things and how it's done in the city of Brantford. But there, number 20 says if that applies at this point. Notwithstanding paragraph 19, any motion may be introduced without notice if council, without debate, agrees on a majority vote to dispense with notice. So at committee level, can we introduce a motion that's not on the agenda without having dispensed with the rules? first. Thank you. Madam Clerk. We have always allowed for the presentation of recommendations on the basis that unless somebody asks for a vote on whether or not we're allowing it to be presented, then we're going to move forward with allowing it. So we've always kind of done it as a less, not restrictive, but more of a facilitating process. So if somebody asks, Oh, I'd like to have a vote on whether or not we're going to consider that now, then, then we would have to do that. But we haven't typically required people to present recommendations at a committee in, ahead of time. I very much appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Councillor Chambers, please. I'll just say one more thing and with regard to what Councillor Gatwin has just said. Uh, I agree that uh, there are going to be problems with the legislation, and I'm not so uh, hepped up on the legislation myself, but this resolution has got nothing to do with ride programs and, and enforcement. That's a whole different matter, and whether you like the legislation or not, this isn't telling anybody that you like the legislation or not. You're sending a message. It, it's like uh, trying to uh, take a a nut off a bolt with a screwdriver it's you're not using the this isn't the tool by which you achieve what you are trying to achieve and that's why i say it's a, a meaningless resolution and councillor gatward is it, it seems to me is trying to send a message by passing a resolution that really is not a, a the, the well, appropriate message and, and Councillor Chambers uh, I, I believe you're correct I, I understand uh, after a couple of our police uh, service board meetings uh, or, or, or I'm sorry community services meetings that the OPP are very well versed now on DUI by alcohol and drugs and they know how to enforce that and yes we will have issues with that I'm sure we will and there may be increasing issues uh, with that but but I do understand what you're saying and I, I believe you're correct in that statement However, we have a motion on the floor. Councillor Simons. Could I have it read back, please, one more time? Thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull up what the resolution actually is. So, um, I believe, Councillor Goward, and you can correct me, that your recommendation is to support the resolution of the town of Richmond Hill. Um, and that the county brand is not supportive of a retail marijuana op cannabis operate outlet in brand. Is that correct, Councillor Gatward? That, that fits the, uh, the gist of the message. Yes, it does. Thank you. That we don't want a retail legal cannabis outlet in our Councillor Simons. And if I may, Mr. Yes, Chair, that's is that not the bylaw that was passed earlier? Um, comes due in July? Yes. Yep. That's the same thing. We already have a bylaw in place. Like, is that correct? That's what I'm trying to get across. It is yeah. correct then. Okay. So it's there. So we've already got that, Councillor Gatward. Yes. 
without prolonging it any longer, thank you, Councillor Simons. That you're correct in that, yes. I just want a clarification. Um, we will have a vote on this, however, because it's been brought to the floor. We have a mover and a seconder. All in favor? Opposed? Not if we we've got we got one joke. No vote. <laughs> The uh, motion has been declined. We've got yes. a duplicate resolution. Yes, that's okay. So now we're voting on items one through twelve. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Moving on to committee reports, uh, staff reports, corporate services. Uh, this is for the insurance RFP. Uh, we did get a reply back on the insurances. There were three le uh, three. Uh, replies on the insurance this was very surprising this is a recommendation there are two options or we can do otherwise how would committee like to hold uh, deal with this councillor coleman please thank you which option there we're there <laughs> <laughs> Seconder, Councillor Gatward. Thank you. 18. 18 months. Thank you. I, I think Councillor Coleman wanted to speak to it. Oh, didn't? I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Gatward. My apologies. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The um, price tag was considerably lower. Um, $400,000 is a, a big savings. I um, wanted to ask staff, I didn't see in the report, um, if you've checked with other municipalities that use this um, company and what were the um, requests or the responses from their use of BFL? I guess yes, I'm, I'll ask Ms. Dale to come up to the podium and, and uh, in a up nutshell, here for a few I guess minutes, it's please. references. And does she have a list of other municipalities that they represent? If you could, Ms. Dale, enlighten us. Good evening, Chairman, members of committee. Uh, we got reference checks um, for BFL. We got three reference checks. Um, they were all positive. Um, those that's what we relied on in terms of their service to other municipalities they provided three references we checked with them we got references back and they were positive and do you, and do you have a list of the municipalities that they represent uh, in the binder I believe I do I could provide that information subsequently before yeah, council I don't if you have wanted to now, but thank you Councillor Boma, please. If I may, through you of staff, um, something that I've become aware of in my own work is, um, do you know, Lynn, if if we are covered? Um, so for when we change insurances, if we change insurances, um, are we covered by Cowan for things that happened um, while Cowan was her insurance um, forever? And the same thing if we're covered now with BFL and we change again in a few years to someone else. Will BFL continue to cover us for that time period when we were covered, even after if we change to a different insurance? So there's different types of coverage. So our liability policies are written generally on an occurrence basis, which means whatever policy was in effect at the time of the occurrence is the insurance policy that responds. So for most of our coverages, our liability coverage if, some, if there was a claim, a uh, motor vehicle accident today and Cowan is still on risk, uh, that's the insurance policy that would apply even if we got notice of that claim two years hence. Uh, the exception to that is uh, there's claims made coverages. Uh, errors and emissions coverage is one of those coverages so that you need to ensure that any of your incidents that may lead to a claim, an error and errors or omissions claim, are reported uh, prior to the transfer over to uh, the other insurer or you need to um, provide an extended, you have to purchase an extended reporting period with the current 
uh, with the current provider to ensure that you've reported everything within the claims because it's the insurance that responds is when the claim is made, not when the incident occurred. So, okay. okay. Thank you. So if there was an, say if there was an errors, errors and emissions incident that happened in January for, or July, for instance, and sometime after February, the claim was made, the new insurer is required to, to cover that. So they want to make sure that everything is reported prior to them coming on risk. And if you were aware of it but didn't report it, you could end up in the position of not having coverage. Yeah. I hope that helps to explain it. Uh, environmental liability is also uh, claims made coverage. Mm -hmm. Councillor Chambers. J just a couple questions for my own understanding. The, uh, the liability portion of our insurance in terms of premium, is that a large percentage of our premium? or a small percentage, and I'm, what I'm getting at, and you can answer in the same way, is they're indicating that there may be up to a 5% increase in liability insurance uh, for various reasons. I'm just wondering what impact a 5% liability insurance increase would be to our overall premium. So liability is the most significant portion of our premium, certainly. Uh, in the report, they had indicated in terms of the 18-month uh, option that we would be saving $15,000 by taking the 18-month policy. So I would presume by, based on that, that $30,000 in premium would be a 5% increase, if that makes any sense. So it, it, it would be a significant amount if it's a 5% uh, increase. So, I, I, I mean, I could go and get the cost proposal and tell you a, a, uh, an exact figure if you wanted that information. Uh, my second uh, question is I'm trying to develop an understanding of, of the insurance company itself. It's my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, and I don't want to present this as fact because I don't know. Uh, but the three companies that quoted are all a little bit different in how they <laughs> they do business. Uh, JLT, I think, is a reciprocal. Cowan is is a, a standalone company, and BFL is kind of a brokerage, and they farm out the various aspects of insurance <laughs> to other companies. Am I correct on that? So um, BFL is a, is, a, is a true broker, so they can uh, develop their municipal insurance program from any insurers that are interested in writing business and putting together a municipal program. So they're a broker. JLT is also a broker. You're thinking of Omax, that was the reciprocal insurer before, and they're no longer writing municipal business. So okay. uh, JLT is, is also a broker that goes out to the market and purchases liability insurance from whoever will bid on it, property insurance, and puts together a municipal program. Cowan, uh, most of their program is put together. It's a, it's a direct program. They're, Cowan in Princeton is a, a general managing agent. They have one program that's developed and they they do a lot of their stuff in-house in, in Princeton. So they do their claims management, their risk management, those kinds of things. They don't go out to the broader market. They have certain insurers that they put the program together through. Um, and then some services can be obtained through a local broker outside so, of that program. Sorry. So, so what I'm getting at, there are probably and I don't know what they are, there are probably pros and cons of each type of insuring insurance. Uh, there's probably pros and cons to the brokerage style of a J, a BFL and pros and cons of, of the style of insurance offered by Cowan. And I'm not asking you what the pros and cons are, but I'm asking whether the pros and cons were evaluated when the recommend in, in terms of making the recommendation? So one of the things we looked at was stability um, in our evaluation and the BFL in their proposal and 
consultant. Um, they've, they've been in the stable market for a period of time. BFL has been writing municipal insurance programs in Quebec for a long period of time. They're stable. They've only been around for about 12 years doing municipal. They're expanding into the Ontario market. But they do have stable insurers, and the consultant was confident that it wouldn't be an issue for them to continue in the municipal insurance market. They've been in for a Would while. Would you just repeat the lot that the consultant said that there really is not a significant there was no pro and con analysis that would make a, a difference in the evaluation? Is that what you just said? They, when we did the market stability evaluation, all the proponents were deemed to be, have a very st stable municipal insurance program, like markets that we could rely on, um, them continuing to be able to obtain insurance for our program. If, if uh, I guess maybe you don't know, maybe I don't know, in terms of a liability, insurance claim and another liability insurance claim and another liability insurance claim if the brokerage is farming out liability insurance to various components is that a problem if we are insured by different venues for liability so on each renewal they go to the market and they would see what insurers were interested in putting together a package uh, for the municipality. The markets that they have are, uh, they're strong markets, they're Lloyds and they're people that have been in the municipal insurance market for a period of time. Um, don't know that there would be a difficulty with them securing coverage for the renewal. I mean, if there was, then I guess we would be back to the market again. But BFL has been in business and has been providing municipal insurance to other municipalities for a period of time. And there wasn't any concerns with respect to the stability expressed to us by the consultant when they reviewed the proposal. And, and just a final question, if I, if I might. Would the coverage that we get as a county be consistent over time if the uh, brokerage uses different insurers over time. That's a, that's a big one. That's a big one. And, and are we protected against that? In other words, do we know now what we're going to have? So right a, now a we know market? exactly what we would have for 18 months. We, we, you know, we have that program with those specific insurers for an 18-month period for sure. When it goes back to renewal, then they would try and secure those same markets. Uh, they may invite other markets to bid as well to try and get uh, competitive pricing. I don't think there was any concern that when they go to market, they wouldn't be able to secure insurance for the municipality through the markets that they have access to. Um, in their proposal, they indicated they had access to 40 different insurance markets. So it wasn't a concern. Uh, from the consultant in terms of longevity or the ability to continue to get coverage. Certainly if they're not able to get coverage for the renewal, we would know and that would be a big concern and we'd have to go back to market again. But other municipalities have been with them for a period of time and haven't had those concerns. So it's hard to know. I mean, it's hard to know how long they would stay in the market. They, they seem to be dedicated to staying in the market uh, developing the Ontario public entity business. That is the focus of their brokerage is, is public entity insurance. They have a very, very big portion of the market in Quebec that's they're trying to expand into Ontario. So yeah, it's a different that market, though. provided some confidence in that regard, but I understand the concern. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, John, Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. So um, interesting conversation here. I guess the, the only question that I still have left here is if we take it strictly, like let's forget about everything else other than the three prices that were given here. Are those three price, prices based on, if you want to call it apples to apples for coverage? Yeah, the proposal, the proposal set out uh, coverage summary sheets mm -hmm. where each uh, proponent needed to complete the summary recovery with uh, the coverage summary sheets with the with the coverage limits and the, the um, exclusions, deductibles, 
and bid on so basically the same insurance program not they're not identical and some of the some of the in the consultants report you see some of the differences in terms of the levels of coverage or the deductibles but they're deemed to be all the programs are deemed to be very comparable in terms of the coverage the um, BFL program is offering 25 million um, the JLT program was offering 25 million in liability coverage the Cowan program is 20 million in liability coverage the JLT program had a aggregate amount on their coverage so that was not not as um, favorable because there was a aggregate limit also of 20 million for the JLT policy there's no aggregate for either the Cowan policy or the or the BFL uh, what BFL is offering which means you could have 10 20 million dollar claims in a year and there would be no upper limit as opposed to an aggregate limit would limit you to 20 million dollars in claims in any policy year that's the def difference. So that was the main difference in some of the coverage was the aggregate amount on the liability for JLT was not as favorable. Thank you. Lynn, the, the, so two of the companies are brokers. One is the insurer. Is the actual insurance company. It's, Cowan is a, is a, So the guarantee company is the insurance company. The Cowan, the Cowan proposal, they get insurance from the guarantee. Their liability is through the guarantee company, mm. through Temple Insurance, and one other that I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> Pardon me? Lloyd's as well. And so they put together a program. They've got three insurers that are insuring their municipal liability program. And, and so the they're the insurance company. Cowan and Princeton manages manages that <coughs> program like an agent would for an insurance company. So they have their own claims department, they have on the risk management department, they have their own underwriting department. They deal with those insurance companies as opposed to a broker who goes out to the market and purchases insurance from any of the insurance companies that they have working relationships with. And, and the one that we talked about, uh, I, I don't know which one it is from, is it the, uh, the name of the company here? The one that we're looking at for 18 and 12 months, are they the ones from Quebec? Yeah, yeah. They, they're, they have local offices here, like in Toronto. They're based right. in Toronto. The bid is from a company in Toronto. What I had indicated was that they have only been in on the Ontario market for approximately 12 years. Right. However, they've been in the Quebec market writing insurance for Quebec public entity entities for a uh, significant period of time. Yeah. They're not new to the public entity business. I only ask that because I know Quebec's insurance market's a little bit different than what it is across Canada for everything else. So I know there's a bit of difference there in the province of Quebec in insurance. Um, that's, that's why I asked that question. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Gatward and then Councillor Chambers. Thank you. Um, so both companies do use other insurers to manage their risk, is what you have said, correct? Can you repeat what you just said? You said that Cowens uses Lloyd's. Cowan, okay, sir. I didn't know what you said there, Cowens. And, and so both companies use various and I, I hadn't heard of BFLs, so I looked them up, and it says that they're um, an employee-owned company, uh, the largest in Canada with 600 employees. Is that, that's the same, that's the right company that I just looked up? <laughs> I would have to look up how I would have to look that up myself. Uh, Council, I, I googled them. And they are a private corporation. Yes. they are a private, privately held corporation. By their employees, according to the the website. Right. Thank Cowan, you. Cowan is also a privately owned. Yes. Corporation. Yes. Thank you. JLT I, is a publicly traded corporation. I found it That's interesting. That's all I can tell you. I found it interesting that Marshes wouldn't quote based on our claims. Thank you, Councillor Gafford. 
Uh, Councilor Chambers, please. And, and just a, a final question with regard to process. Uh, can you uh, assure me that the, the process was fair in, in, in this respect? Um, prior to going to the request for proposals, uh, we were provided with a offer from Collins. Yes. And that offer, I believe, was public. And I'm wondering in terms of process, uh, have, have we taken that into consideration? Is our, our process clean? <laughs> uh, in other words, if, if one company uh, is, makes an offer, uh, does that give the other companies an advantage or is the process designed to overcome those kind of things? I'm not sure how I can answer that you question, can't. Councillor Chambers. It was out in the public for sure. That information, I don't know if that information was accessed by the other people in the market. Uh, I'm sure that they would know what the, the bid or what the, <coughs> the uh, uh, proposal was from yeah. Cowan before they submitted their proposals. They have people out there watching the market, who's getting what, who's not getting what in insurance on a 24-hour day basis. That's their industry. Um, and that, you know, that's taken into consideration, I'm sure, as well. Um, I, I also feel that, and, and I'm glad we went through this process because I didn't understand that there were underwriters that, or, or companies that farmed out the insurance as a broker for municipalities. I didn't think it was still done that way, but apparently it is in some cases. Um, but it's a good process that we went through. The concern I have is, uh, is um, not the concern, but, but one of the things I, I look at too is the relationships that we've had in the last uh, 20 or so years with our current supplier and, and the, uh, uh, how it's been handled very well by our current supplier as well. So I, I think that all has to be taken into consideration as well. Um, I believe they provided an excellent service to us, but uh, I'm not trying to be biased, that's just fact. Okay, we have uh, Mayor Eddie, please. Uh, I, the question was asked, who does this company serve, the one that we're uh, looking at, the tender? Do you have a municipality they serve? If I could be excused Certainly. for a minute, go I'll go get my... And have we checked with that municipality? Yes, she has. Or yes, more than one. Three of them. Uh, I think that... Miss Dale said she had, she had three uh, municipalities or, or bidders, or I'm sorry, insurance comp insurance takers from that company, and they uh, all came back with uh, high levels of confidence on these companies. Go ahead, Lynn. So we obtained references from Prince Edward, Prince Edward County, oh. City of Peterborough, and the Town of Newmarket. Oh, really? City of Peterborough oh. mm -hmm. and the Town of Newmarket. <coughs> okay. And these were reference companies, correct? Current users of the insurance? They are currently, uh, they are currently being served by BFL. Thank you. Your Worship is. Thank you. Any other questions? We do have a recommendation of option one. Seeing no more questions, all in. Councillor Chambers. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm going to put a, a motion for deferral uh, for. Uh, a, a legal opinion on process and, and my two concerns are this and I don't know whether I'm going to get a seconder uh, with the entire process and the process uh, what would happen uh, or the options the municipality would face if this recommendation is not accepted and another option is accepted. 
In other words, so I, the I, clarity I, is you want it, you want clarity on was the process fair, knowing that that one price had already come out and the, then requests were that, asked for. That's one, and the the, the other, other one is the other concern I have is if this motion fails and we ask and for another uh, option is selected, whether that leaves us open for legal ramifications. And may I add to that, you want this to go to our litigator to find this out? I think that we can't answer that, so it would have to be somebody. Yes, I, I'm asking for a legal opinion to be provided right. by counsel on the two aspects of process. Okay. And I'm moving a deferral uh, requesting that we be provided with that information. And I'm, I'm hoping that it can be done in a time frame that, that is, leaves us insured. Thank you. Uh, seconder, Councillor Pierce. Any questions, Councillor uh, Simons, and Th then Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a concern with this because when we sent this out to RFP, we were aware that the, the, the figure from Cowan was public knowledge. So why did we put it out for RFP if we knew the price was there? I don't know how le and legally they can were bound like. Well, I, no, I don't we don't know that, Councillor. We don't know what we're bound by. That's why we're, we're. Uh, but wanting... we knew that the price was there when we put it on. Yes, RFP. we did. So we did. But we don't know the ramifications of this, and that's why we're checking or requesting to check, Councillor Gatward. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. But it's like putting the cart bef before the horse. We haven't even voted on the the motion. If it passes, we don't need a deferral. We're taking the staff recommendation and the lowest bid and being cognizant and transparent and accountable to our taxpayers. Well, if it fails, as Councillor Chambers is, seems to be worried about, then I suppose. Well, well excuse me, Councillor. Don't be making assumptions, please. Well, Don't, okay. Do not make assumptions. Okay. If we, if we went to... Um, it what the councillor is trying to do, excuse me, what the councillor is trying to do is, is make sure council is covered yeah. so that A, was the process correct, and B, do we have to look at uh, the, the, the bid from Cowan any further? That's what we're checking out. Now, if you want to go and make a decision now and find out later that our battleship has been sunk, that's fine. I would rather take the uh, uh, easier road and, and maybe take another look at this. We have a lawyer that can look after this. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to make a decision on it. I can tell you that, and I don't know anybody else around this table who is. I just think that we could do that between the, this committee meeting and council if there's a concern. We could do it in that two-week period. Well, and, and that's your opinion, and I thank you for that. You're welcome. We have a motion on the floor to defer. Councillor Chambers? And similarly, similarly, Mr. Chairman, we can take two weeks to get a legal opinion and decide it at council. But if you want to ram it through and take your chances, then you can convince everybody to vote for it. Well, we do have a motion on the floor to uh, defer. All in favor of the deferral motion. Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. This will be deferred until council. Yes. Thank you. Moving on to CD 1805-9A2. Procedural bylaw housekeeping amendment. Councilor Boma. Seconder, Councilor Pierce. Questions or concerns? All in favor? Opposed, carried, thank you. <coughs> Number three, there is a recommendation, accommodation review options. CD 1810. Second or Councillor Coleman. Questions or concerns? Mayor Eddy, please. Mr. Chair, I disagree with the uh, motion. I would like to see the table uh, for one, uh, one month. Uh, <coughs> We have the office center committee 
has a request that the county to determine if it is interested in any space in the lot, et cetera, when it's completed, which it will be in the And how much? And it seems to me that that should be, uh, that report should come forward. Well, providing that the recommendation is passed, I call it slap. Sorry, I'm joking. Uh, that should be uh, dealt with by council prior to this study started, simply because if it is determined that the municipality wishes space in the Bucket Center, which there is considerable space, as you know, on two floors, uh, it should be part of the study. But if it's not, this motion is not pursued, then we won't know whether the municipality wants any or not. But it, it seems to me it's clear and it's a better procedure to do it in that order. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, CAO Emerson, did you have a comment? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The mayor spoke to Michael and myself about this today. Uh, as, from a staff perspective, we've spoken to Robin. We would agree with this if you want to put it off because uh, we weren't thinking about that at the time when we put this together, but it does make sense. It's another option to consider. Would you like to make that more? Well, I'm sorry. I appreciate the compliment that it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, yes, I would, I would move that this be deferred. Uh, deferred for one cycle only. Would we have a seconder for that? Councillor Simons? In, in order to deal with that report, especially if it's approved by council, which it would need to be. Thank you, Your Worship. We have a mover and a seconder. Councillor Bowman, you had a question, then Councillor Gatward. I, I'm still comment. somewhat confused why um, wouldn't wouldn't that just naturally become a part of this regardless and and um, I don't know why the deferral is necessary if if we approve this here then I'm sure the pocket center will still be looked at as a possible location I don't I don't, I don't understand the the uh, the need for a deferral let's move forward and obviously Robin's well aware of the fact that the bucket center is another possible location also um, so I, 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 I fail to see the need for a deferral thank you mr. chair <laughs> that makes sense too but I'd like Robin could you speak to this please Robin if you could come to the podium please I, I think all we were trying to say is Maybe what you just said. As long as it's considered as part of this package. Through you, Mr. Chair. Well, if option two or three are approved, um, it would take into consideration the Bucket Center. It would be looked at as an option. If it's not an option, depending on the outcome of the report that's brought forward, then it would either be looked at or not looked at. So we're, Robin, if I may, may suggest, then we really don't need that deferral then. Is that what you're, it's, it's, okay. Yeah. How is committee like to wish, how would committee wish to deal with this? Mayor Eddy, please. Why it does not need deferral? Why? Councilor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we have this building, we have the administration building in Burford, and this um, has not been in um, the county's, has not been the county staff locations for that long. I remember when council was considering whether or not to use the administration building at Burford and build on at Mount Vernon and have one large location. Staff are saying that it's inefficient having employees all in different buildings. And 
Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's, maybe it's efficient for ratepayers who use those different buildings. I, I, think, I think we're putting the, pardon me just for a second, I think we're putting the cart in front of the horse here. All we're talking about right now is the potential of looking at that. When that's decided, then that topic can come up when we're looking at those buildings. But yeah. right now wouldn't be the time to discuss that. Okay, I, and my I, question then would be, Mr. Chair, and you, you may be able to answer this. Okay. How many employees are we looking to put, or how many square feet additional do we need? Do we know that even? That, that's and that's why I just said to you those are questions that come up if in in time we decide to do that that would be something that would be brought up in that line of questioning when you do your scope yeah. I, I guess I'm I'm having difficulty spending seventy five thousand dollars to have somebody tell us what to do we're the ones that and the staff are the ones that use the facilities day to day and why can't we strike a committee and do it ourselves? I mean, do we have to have someone come from Toronto and tell us what to do? Council, Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, first of all, uh, who's to say that they're going to come from Toronto, but that's a mood point. Let's think of how much money that we've spent in this building alone, yeah. moving walls around, adding yeah. people in, shifting things around, adding people in. This has to be done. This is a good news story. Yeah. We are getting too big. Yeah. We are getting bigger than what the, the building is. Multiple buildings are. We're expanding as a, as a, a, a county, which is a good thing. Would it be nice to have everybody all under one floor? Absolutely. The reality of it is probably not going to happen. I think this is going to be money well spent. It will take a look at all the different options out there, what fits the best, and give us what we need long term. Not six months down the road we have to shift again, six months down the road we have to shift again. That to me is spending more money, think of the money in the last, this term of council that's been spent on this building to try and accommodate. This must be done and I'm all for either option two or three. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Mayor Eddie, would you like to withdraw? Back to the uh, initial request. The request is simply to discuss the options that are Absolutely. Yeah. Because the study has been done, the report, sorry, has been done. Yes. So there should be a report deciding whether the company will wishes to use, because there is considerable space there, as you know. There's even parking spaces. Absolutely. But then it has to be decided if the county is willing to look at something of a recommendation that that be included. Thank you. Councillor Pierce? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'd be willing to put forth option two and then that takes care of all that. Councillor Boma? Can we first deal with the motion to defer? I'm trying to deal with that now, yes. Thank you. Mayor Eddie, would you like to withdraw that motion to defer or would you like us to vote on that? I would like to Okay, there is a motion on the floor. To defer one cycle. All in favor? I don't have a seconder for that yet. Yes, Sorry. we did have a seconder, Councillor yeah. Simons. Yeah. Sorry, Heather. Sorry. Okay, we'll ask the question again. Motion to defer. Opposed? Motion is defeated. Count. And Councillor Boma, you'll second? And then if I could speak to it. Please go ahead. The point of this is to look at our options. Um, so I think to preemptively choose one um, is too early. So let's wait for the report. So I will vote against this motion. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, item number two. All in favor? Could I see a show of hands, please, for number two? Opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, general manager's update, please. So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, you probably all noticed that the uh, report for the interim tax bill was pulled, and I just wanted to explain that um, we pulled that because it was written how it's been written in the past, which is um, so that the first uh, tax levy bills would be based on last year's actual uh, taxes that were billed. But because we have the um, the budget passed, we're going to we want to go right ahead with the 2018 rates. So that's why we pulled that. And also related to uh, taxes, uh, the new tax legisla legislation allows us to um, now send out tax bills via email. So I just wanted to let you know that um, our software, Veiltech, has developed um, a module that will allow us to do that. So we're in the process of trying to figure out the best way to contact taxpayers to get that information back so we can send them out uh, via email. And on a good news note, um, we're having our detachment committee meeting on um, January 23rd. And so we've got the, uh, the initial design and the schematics all done. So we'll be presenting that at the January 23rd meeting right before council. And then we'll bring it to council in February so everyone can see what it's going to look like. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through to Robin, um, and this is related to one of our Friday uh, handouts. Um, if somebody doesn't pay their taxes, they're in tax arrears. Was that a three-year process and is now a two-year process? Am I, did I read that correctly? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, fantastic, number one, that we're having that meeting on the detachment. I'm, I'm excited about that. Now, rather than waiting a whole other month, we're having council that night. And I want to find a way that we get that information to council that night rather than wait a month. We probably could do that. Um, we'll have the architect here anyway. So um, I think we could probably get that on the agenda for council to do a uh, presentation. I, I would move that we do that if, if that's what's necessary, but I think that would be uh, best case scenario rather than wait another month. Okay, we'll see if we can get that arranged. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a, a general manager's update at uh, community services today, and I'll have one at Public Works tomorrow dealing with mostly uh, those uh, matters regarding that. I will say that my friends at MTERA Waste uh, Management will be at uh, Public Works Committee tomorrow morning, and uh, they will be doing a presentation on to provide um, a status update to committee on our ongoing challenges with the collection, uh, collection contract. Um, and they'll be uh, pre prepared to answer a lot of questions, and then um, I'll be uh, dealing with the chair as well to see if he wants to go in camera. We are obviously uh, in deep review of the contract and its various terms on how to how, how to deal with this. So, um, but that that will be tomorrow morning at Public Works Committee. Um, a couple of updates on uh, Brandon Spill Enterprises. We had our, our, our final board meeting of, of 2018, just before Christmas, and the, at, the last, at that last meeting, the BME board did uh, review a business case to extend fiber optics into Canesville, and uh, we are now proceeding with that. And in fact, we issued a press release today. So uh, we'll, our sales team will be out there uh, meeting with businesses in the Canesville area to connect to our, uh, our, our soon-to-be-built fiber optic network out there. Along with uh, that, other BME news, and I think important news, the first RFQ for the SWIFT program was actually released late last week. And so that's, uh, that's the large provincial uh, um, uh, 
fiber optic network program. Um, this will be the, uh, the large trunk line infrastructure. We probably won't be building any of this. We're the smaller uh, infrastructure pieces to that. That would be the second RFP. But we think that's good news to see that first RFP out there. We're eagerly anticipating the second RFP. And BME is a, is a preferred uh, qualified supplier for uh, SWIFT program funds and uh, the associated infrastructure. So it's a couple uh, quick updates on matters. Mr. Chair, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the dam project, um, why did I think BME was handling that? Because it's, it's on our agenda tonight as it's a council project. Mr. Chair, it's, uh, municipal staff or myself, I basically have been have been uh, carrying that project, um, and I've been, as as my report mentioned, I've been using some external engineering support. Right. BME will get involved when we get into the hydro turbine portion, where we'll be using their basically um, uh, you know, green energy systems expertise. But that's quite a ways down the road. Our, our main emphasis now is on the dam itself, its condition, whether it can be rebuilt, and what the finances of that look like. So, okay. so we'll continue to carry that. That's a civil project. It's outside of the talent area of my BME staff, and, uh, and so I'll continue to carry that. So. Okay, and did you have the report that was done back in the 80s where they did a assessment condition on the dam? Mr. Chair, yeah, that was a that was a that was a non in water assessment. This will be a, an in river assessment. Um, but yeah, we do have that report. It was a we we've it, it was reviewed by the uh, the consulting firm that that, that I just recommended. So. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. A uh, few things I'd like to talk about. In your package, you have the year-end permit summaries. Just wanted to highlight there that our, our permit activity was uh, $10 million above what it was for 2016, which is a, a good thing to see. Um, what we've also done uh, as part of our trying to assess what our impacts are going to be with new growth coming on special for residential is the building division has looked at um, what sort of projects we're expecting and the amount of projects we're expecting to come up in 2018. Um, and what we know of right now that would be coming in, we're anticipating it to be completed in 2018. For ICI, which is industrial, um, commercial, institutional, it could be anywhere from about 35 to $40 million in construction activity. On top of that, we'll have the residential, which could bring in anywhere from 80 to $100 million in construction act activity. Um, with the potential revenue for two to $2.4 million in building permit fee revenue that will be coming in. Now with the amount of empl uh, employment, um, industrial activity that's taking place, um, it's all covered under part three of the building code. Um, and part three applies specifically to commercial and industrial facilities. So what we are probably gonna be looking at, and we'll be coming back to council to get approval for this, is potentially hiring a plans examiner to deal with just the part three. Currently that work is spread out under the billing inspectors and the chief billing official. Uh, we're looking at that right now. Of course, that would be um, all covered through fees, existing fees that we collect. But I just wanted to let the committee know that uh, we're probably gonna be bringing something forward for a dedicated plans examiner. Um, and uh, that's about all I have to update for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Mark, will you explain to me what, who we hired, what position it was when we hired for um, the position for building inspector, I think? Can you tell me what that was for? No, we, uh, council approved in the budget, I think is what you're yeah, questioning, yeah, yeah. a uh, lot grading technologist, and that's to deal with lot grading. That position would be looking at, um, uh, as it ties to building permits, we'll be looking at lock grading and drainage around from around the properties. Okay. Currently, building inspectors are qualified to look at to make sure there's a positive drainage away from a foundation for about two feet or so. Yes, correct. What happens beyond there? It, we're relying on others to give us that information. Okay, and we're so going to have that for ourselves. This anyway. person will be doing okay. that. Yes. So that has is that going to be paid for through fees also, or is that a tax levy? 
uh, for the, the one that was currently approved or the part three that we're looking the at? The one that's currently approved. The one that's currently approved for the budget, 10% of it was going to be tax levy hit. Um, the rest of it was going to be covered through a combination of different fees. Okay. Uh, it, they would be administering the site alteration bylaw, so there'll be fees with that. Okay. Well, we figure probably most of the revenue coming in for to cover the fees for that would be uh, building permit issuance, okay. uh, lot severances, because we collect the security on mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, lot grading drains reviews as part of the subdivision approvals. Okay. So we, would we take an administration fee, and we can draw on that administration fee to cover off all of okay. our costs, and we'd be doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mark, looking at the residential building in the last couple of years, it hasn't really changed that much. Mm -hmm. Now, I know in our budget time we talked about hiring X number of people. Yeah. Now, is there a gap between the expected increase in all this and we have people on staff or we don't that are there to, when this comes about, to look after. I'm just concerned about are we paying people now to do something which hasn't occurred yet? No. Um, we are, I, I believe the review that was done, I'm going to go by memory here, what performance concept said is that their idea would get people in place now in anticipation of it so we aren't backlogged and we're constantly playing catch up. Right now we're able to accommodate it. What uh, the chief building official and deputy chief building official are doing now are looking at ways to, to fill in that gap. So uh, they themselves are going to be trying to do what they can to go out and, and cover off any sort of deficiencies. Um, if there's an issue, then there might be an issue later on. But we're hoping that with this position that's coming in, that would alleviate, at least be able to take the review portion away from the building inspectors and focus it on to a, a dedicated person so they can actually do more inspections through the construction. Um, just to let you know, uh, large, probably the percentage of time, if you look at the amount of time dedicated towards a type of building use, residential actually takes up quite a bit of time for inspections. Um, I'd probably disproportionately look at the amount of revenue that comes in and the amount of floor area that's actually created. The ICI stuff, it's, it's a little bit um, more efficient use of time, I'd say. Just uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, on a totally different matter, <laughs> our, and we talked a little bit about it tonight, our planning documents as they currently exist are totally silent on recreational marijuana. The reason for that is because recreational marijuana is not legal. So obviously we can't have in our planning documents authorized uses for something that's illegal, but that's going to change. What's happening, and, and we do have provisions for medicinal marijuana production facilities, and that's allowed in all zones, or not residential, but industrial and agricultural. What's happening is people are applying for approvals for medicinal marijuana production facilities with the understanding that when recreational um, production is, is becomes legal that they can transform their medicinal marijuana production facilities into uh, both medicinal and recreational. And in my opinion, recreational production facilities are totally different in scope and magnitude and a variety of other things. Uh, as a matter of fact, the legal framework isn't even in place yet, so we don't know. And I'm wondering, we need to catch up or be prepared for the legalization of marijuana for recreational uses when that in fact comes. And it's my understanding uh, that they are still consulting at the government level on, on what and how to do that. We're going to get caught flat-footed here and a lot of people are going to be upset. Uh, not only if we all of a sudden try to regulate recreational marijuana 
on people who have medicinal marijuana facilities. And I'm wondering if we should not consider, and I know they're, they're sometimes uh, controversial, but an interim control bylaw on marijuana production, medicinal or otherwise, until we have a, a firm understanding of what the regulations are and what our planning documents should reflect. And that uh, it may s prevent a lot of problems down the road. So my question is, should we, and maybe you can't answer this right now, but should we consider an interim control bylaw? And, and for those of you that don't know what that is, that basically allows a moratorium on planning decisions until such time as a policy framework is in place to, in fact, regulate them. I had a brief conversation with Scott Oliver, who was at a Long Point meeting, and he basically said that that may be a, a, a good example of where an interim control bylaw could be used. And uh, I, we spoke briefly about recreational versus medicinal marijuana, and just like everybody else, we're not sure what recreational marijuana production is, is going to encompass. But the scope and magnitude of recreational marijuana is a lot more vast and maybe a hundredfold times more uh, going to be more prevalent if, if Colorado and California and Oregon or wherever they do this is, is in fact in place. In other words, what I'm saying is a medicinal marijuana production facility, maybe small, compact, uh, quite uh, unobtrusive. But if that is going to be a recreational or transform into a recreational, it could be the equivalent of an intensive farming operation in an agricultural zone, and we have no regulations or no policy framework to do that. So I'm suggesting that perhaps you can investigate whether an interim control bylaw is an appropriate course of action and what impact that has on the applications that are currently in front of us, both in terms of uh, recognizing the impact on the neighborhood and recognizing the impact on someone who is investing perhaps millions on a medicinal marijuana facility with the understanding that as soon as recreational uh, is legal, it can become a recreational. Sure, if I can try to talk to that, I'll see what I can do. Interim control bylaws, yeah, uh, we've had just very brief conversation if that's an option that's available. Interim control bylaws are good for a year, but there's sort of an of a expectation that you're doing it and you're going to study it. Um, uh, the last example I can think of, one that I, of an interim control bylaw, was a rural municipality that was trying to deal with aggregate operations. They were going to pass an interim control bylaw saying you can't have any aggregate, um, but they didn't have any money or weren't planning on studying it, so they asked the province to give them money to study it. I don't think it went anywhere, but the idea is that you're going to stop it so you can assess it and better study it, but they're good for a year. Um, I believe you can go for a, a renewal for one year. I'm not 100% sure, but that's what I recall. So there's, there's a very limit, limited amount of time that you can deal with this. The regulations, we haven't seen them yet. Um, I believe from talking with our planning staff is that um, medical or one thing is certainly something that is covered, recreational is not. Our bylaw doesn't allow recreational at this time, and I believe that it might be a, on a site-by-site, -site, case by case consideration at this point. But I'd say that if we're looking at doing that, we can certainly bring it back to, I'd say later in, this, in the spring, where we're getting a little bit getting closer to the deadline for um, the expectation time for medical merit or recreational to be brought in. The only reason I'd suggest that is that it's a matter of that one year time frame that we've got. Um, we want to make sure we're studied. Unless council would like to bring us, have it uh, come in sooner rather than later, we could do that as well. Mm. Mm. If I could just, uh, and I don't mean to rag the puck here, and I, I know we all want to leave, but. Um, with regard to an application that is an application for medicinal marijuana, I, 
I really have a, a, a feeling that they are assuming that that will automatically transform to recreational production facility. And we, I, if we are going to regulate recreational marijuana facilities and medicinal marijuana facilities in a different manner, in terms of perhaps where they can be located, then those people that are applying for medicinal marijuana applications should be aware of that. Mm. Uh, because that can, if, if you're going to invest $5 million in a facility with the expectation that it's going to become this, and the municipality says, hold on, we're ch we're, that's what I'm, what I'm concerned about. And uh, 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 actually, in the former township of Burford, we did use an interim control bylaw, and just for anybody's information, on fish farming, which was not allowed anywhere in, in our municipality. And we had a few farmers that would have a, a, a couple tanks and, and produce rainbow trout, and everything was all the, the greater. But then we had someone come along that wanted to dig 10 acre, four 10 acre ponds to raise fish in outside of Burford, which was going to impact the aquifer. So you have a 40 acre pond fish farm as opposed to a, a, a 10, <laughs> you know, a, a tank. Yeah. And we were caught flat footed because we didn't have any regulations for fish farming right. and they were allowed anywhere. So that's what we did. We went into an interim control bylaw which moratorialized the, uh, if that's a word, fish farming until we studied it and figured out what we wanted to do so that people could be regulated. And it wasn't pretty. <laughs> it was actually, a matter of fact, quite ugly uh, with Ontario Municipal Board Appeals. And so, it, it, but I'm thinking that this might be the opportunity or the, the course of action. Sure, and if I may respond, um, I think it might be appropriate to get at least something in front of uh, the committee, which would be at least a legal opinion, because I'm curious myself, yeah. is that does medical marijuana, does it automatically, then can it automatically revert to um, recreational marijuana? Because the question I'd have in my mind is that growing of a crop is growing of a crop. Yeah. If, um, if you grow marijuana, and if it's gonna be used for medicinal or recreational, um, is there a difference? The real difference might be on who it's actually being sold to and the outlets where it's being distributed and sold to. It could be that that is the only difference between the two. I don't know. I'd, but I'd be curious to find out if that is the only difference. So maybe what we could do is consult with our solicitor. I believe this work is already being reviewed elsewhere. I know that staff are already having discussions internally. We certainly have discussed the idea of potential of the use of an interim control bylaw. So I think it'd be worth at least talking to our solicitor about that and coming back to the committee with an opinion on it. Councillor Bowman and Councillor Simons and Councillor Gatward. Yeah, if I may through you, uh, Mr. Chair, this, this conversation feels somewhat similar to when we were talking about uh, retail outlets. Yes. And um, staff at the time said that wasn't necessary. They were prohibited in our bylaw. But then I think it was the next council meeting we had a bylaw before us to prohibit. And... Um, and um, I don't see it as a bad idea to prohibit um, the growing of recreational marijuana until such time as we get clarity on the law so that everyone's clear on where we stand on that so that we don't get anyone going preemptive uh, on us for the same reason as we prohibited at, until present day um, retail outlets in the County of Brant. If, if I, sorry, if I may respond, I think the preemptive part was that the, the was for clarity. The update of the bylaw was for just provide clarity and certainty to it, the, which followed interpretations. But I think we also have to be kind of cautious because if a use is legal in Ontario and in Canada, I'm not certain you could have an outright prohibition on a use. And I can only deal with a couple instances where I know where I used to work, uh, there was uh, strip clubs that were uh, operating. Somebody came in for a license, the municipality tried to refuse it and they were taken to court and told that you had to because it, it violated competition, uh, competition laws. Uh, the other one I can think of is Tim Hortons. Uh, they had a, um, I believe it was Ottawa, was trying to shut down drive throughs and said you couldn't have any drive throughs Tim Hortons took them to the Supreme Court of Canada and they uh, lost, Ottawa lost, 
because it was a legal use. So an outright prohibition of a use is something you may not, where you have to kind of get um, a legal opinion to determine whether you can or not, which is why I think a legal opinion would be mm -hmm. very helpful. Councillor Simons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple things. When we did the tour at the medicinal plant in Paris, um, I re recall them saying that there is quite a difference between the growing procedures for medicinal because mm -hmm. of the med medical end of it. Um, recreational, I don't know. My yeah. question is, though, um, do we need a separate bylaw when they, when they start growing recreational? Will there have to be a separate bylaw in order to get that passed to make it make it legal, or can they follow through under the original bylaw of the medicinal, and not come to us whatsoever? Well, we aren't the licensing authority. No, I understand that. So all we can do is with with the land use. The land um, use. So, and I think that that's where we're where Councillor Chambers is asking is that we need to understand where our boundaries are on this. Really, what are our, our abilities and powers <coughs> under the legislation that allow municipalities to control land use? And, and I'd say I, I don't really know. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is yeah. we have already a, sold a piece of land mm -hmm. for medicinal mm -hmm. um, close to residences. Yeah. And could we be in kind of jeopardy for that eventually down the road? Well, I, I don't know what the, the setbacks would be. Um, in, in Ontario, we have guidelines which are called D6 guidelines. And D6 guidelines deal with sensitive land uses and se separation between sensitive land use and industrial use. Depending on the type of land use you've got, the increase or the, the, the separation distance increases up to potentially, I think, at least the, either 300 meters or a kilometer potentially. But they can also be 30 meters. And they would assess things such as truck traffic, noise, odors coming from a building. So for instance, truck traffic has a fairly high D6 guideline setback. So therefore, their, their distance from residential or a sense of land use, which could be institutional as well, or a school, uh, would have to be increased. If there isn't a sense of land use there, then uh, there wouldn't be a setback that would apply. And how would so, that be established? Well, the province updates their D6 guidelines. I've heard that they might be doing that. I'm not 100% sure. But the DC, D6 guidelines, we'd be looking to the province for uh, guidance and interpretation on some of these. Okay, thank you. Councillor Gatwork, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Health Canada approves and licenses all the medicinal medical marijuana um, growing operations in Canada. We have several in the county. Yeah. I don't know why anyone would want to turn their medicinal grow operation into recreational because, because the law, the new law, allows anybody, you, you, whoever, to grow two plants in your own backyard. It's two. It's two. Let's we, can think, please. we can agree to disagree on that. And they can only be four feet tall. So maybe that's where the four is coming from. I, I don't understand why there's a, an issue here because the whole point of legalizing it is so that the government can control it through their outlets. They won't be able to control what's grown in people's backyards. The only thing they can control is how tall it is if the neighbor complains. And then we're going to be the ones going out with bylaw enforcement, looking at those plants and saying, yeah, you got to cut two feet off. It's too tall. So the shops that are selling are not going to buy from any old person. It's going to be a licensed, licensed facility. It's going to be controlled by the province through the for the federal government. That's that's my understanding of how it's supposed to work. Thank you, Councillor Obama. Please, just for your information, the adopted legislation is for plants, and the one meter height restriction has been dropped. Um, and I know greenhouse growers are quite interested in this because I was talking to a friend of mine who is. And I can, uh, with a, sing a single piece of paper, delegate my four plants 
to uh, a greenhouse. And so this is something that we have to get a handle on because uh, and then he only has to get 20 people in any greenhouse can grow 80 plants. And so it's, it is definitely bears further investigation. So that's already in the legislation? We're getting a bit of off topic here. We're, Mr. Pomponi, do we have any direct questions for Mr. Pomponi? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Pomponi. I'm sorry, everyone, but we could carry this on for a long time, and, and it's something that we're... Okay, moving along to economic development, strategic investment, general manager's update, please. Please don't bring up marijuana plants, if you, <laughs> if you don't mind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, that's not on my list. Um, I just have a few quick updates. Um, a big initiative for 2018 for our team is going to be um, embarking on an economic development strategy. So we are hoping to get the RFP out by the end of this month. Um, so I'll keep you posted on that. Um, at the last meeting, um, I also uh, let you know that a bid was submitted, a joint bid between Brantford and City of Brantford and the County of Brant for the Ontario 55 plus games. I'm happy to report that we've been shortlisted. Um, if you haven't heard, I believe a memo went out, but um, we got that news on uh, mid-December, December 13th, and staff worked um, quite diligently over the holidays and have put together a tour um, with ministry representatives, which will be happening on Thursday. Um, so we should get news uh, quite soon on that, on um, the outcome, but uh, they've worked really hard to put this together in a really short period of time mm -hmm. with the holidays, so um, they've done a great job on that. Um, the employment land strategy is also something that's um, been on our agenda, looking at um, the, the volume of employment land that we have and uh, keeping that supply um, coming in the pipeline and where our designations are going to go. We got news from the province, finally, um, that their methodology has been released and they are holding an information session um, again this Thursday, January the 11th and we will have um, staff attending that session and hopefully we'll have more information at that point on how we can move forward with phase two of that study. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just curious how you're settling into your new surroundings. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Um, I think we've got all our furniture now. Um, everybody really likes the space and uh, it's working really well with having um, Cole up there um, again, we've been looking at doing a lot more work with them on workshops and um, business resources and whatnot. So, um, so far, so good. It's it's very good space. And just a little advice about the office. The red chairs are very comfortable. Don't sit there too long. You'll fall asleep. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Rob. Uh, Allison, thank you. Moving along, there is no communications. Matters referred by council. There is a one item, other business for Councillor Simons, please. Other business? Oh, we're at that already. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I really don't want to bring this up, but I am going to bring it up because it pertains to me. And um, I would just like to read this, if I may. Um, this is after reading the information sent to all councillors from Councillor Cardi regarding the committee of meeting for the Baca Centre. Um, we all know the Baca Centre committee is a committee of council, and um, we have topics at that meeting exactly the same as everyone else at a committee meeting. Lots of verbal talk, lots of talk that doesn't go any further than that table. The criticism demonstrated in this material was very critical of the committee. Concrete criticism could be advantageous when the total committee is addressed and able to respond, which in this case did not happen. I find it strange how Councillor Cardi was able to draw conclusions in regards to his comments as he attended the meeting for approximately one half hour. Normal and correct procedure would be for Council Cardi to bring his concerns to the committee in question, address them, and give the members an opportunity to respond. I'm hoping this occurrence does not continue in this manner in the future, and after a majority vote has been established at a council, all council members would accept the vote and move on. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor Simons, and I'd like to respond to that if I could. Um, 
I had actually been to three meetings and the first meeting I stayed for approximately an hour and a half and the second meeting I was there for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour. But that aside, it doesn't take a rocket scientist uh, a lot to figure out it's been taken over a year and you still haven't got a business plan. That's a concern for this council, from my opinion, and I'll tell you why. You don't have a business plan, exactly like your person who sat in Mr. Miller's chair said, well, we have to come back in 2018 to that person. We have to come back in 2018 to that person. The simple reason is, if you don't have a business plan to show someone who is willing to give money, they're not going to give you money. So don't be putting the cart in front of your horse. I've done over 200 business plans myself. Don't put the cart in front of your horse trying to get money from people who aren't going to give you money if you don't have a business plan. And that's my major concern to that committee. And if anybody else who's had a business background had sat in that meeting, they would say the same thing. Perhaps you have no business plan. May I respond to your comments? Absolutely. Mr. Chair, if you have these concerns, why would you not address them to the people addressing the th at the table? Why would you not address them? Why are you addressing the council who never attends the meetings? I address the council probably for that exact reason. A council needs to know what's going on. Well, that's the end of conversation. I've taken it this far, and I would appreciate from now on, if you have concerns, you bring them to the committee so they can respond to your concerns. This isn't fair. This is like blind I don't think it's fair, Councillor, in all honesty. I don't think it's fair that we could be put in a position down the road. And I don't think that's going to be fair either. Because if you don't raise the money, we're going to be in trouble. Bottom line, we're going to be in trouble. But who said we're not going to sell the, we're not going to It's been a year and a half. You strike when the iron's hot and you never struck when the iron was hot. Councilor Pierce. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, first of all, um, clarification, Councilor Weed has attended many, many of the meetings, so there are other councilors that go there too. But I must admit, when I read this email, um, I was a little put off by it too. Um, number one, we do, we did, we do have a business plan. There was much, excuse me, I have the floor right now, so you can shake your head all you want, Mr. Chair. I will. That, that's, that's, if that's the way you want to play it, that's fine. But we do have a business plan that we've talked about from the beginning. We got a consultant in, which put us through the fundraising things. You will notice in the, in the meetings that are coming to, the minutes coming to council, that we have stopped the consultant uh, services at this point in time because we have found from those people that our business plan although it was a plan wasn't as in-depth as some of them wanted it to be part of the problem we had was we had a building there we had visions and a business plan of what we wanted to do we weren't sure if we were going to be able to make that work within that facility that's why and you talked in the in the email about having other people come in and, and, and discuss things and the RFQ going out or the RFIQ going out that was to understand what other people might be interested in using that facility we had people come to us when it wasn't even advertised what we were doing that wanted to use that facility the thought was okay fine and dandy if these people are coming ahead to to want to use this facility and we haven't even advertised anything out there then who else might want to use this facility maybe we can expand on the business plan that we did have and the visions that we did have so personally I take full offense to you saying we didn't have a business plan when we absolutely did right from the get-go secondly I take offense to the fact that um, you're saying it's a year and a half how many times have I sat in this council chambers and stated the fact sorry Brian I'm gonna point you out here when it was talked about and Brian was on the arena it takes time in order to get this money it's not something that's done overnight you talk about somebody giving you your money there mr. chairman absolutely you're talking a million dollars you're talking five hundred thousand dollars that's not chump change so obviously that's not something that's going to be done overnight it takes time as it has with every other big project that this council has endorsed so I take offense to that as well. Yes, it's been a year and a half. You talk about the KFC in there. The, the, the decision on the KFC was made only in late third, fourth quarter, late in fourth quarter of 2017. So it hasn't been months and months and months since that decision has been made. So you know what? I agree with Councillor Simons in the sense that there is places to take these and the committees are. We've talked about this around this table many times. I have never heard you say anything like in that letter and all of a sudden it was blown up. Did I take it personally? No. Personally, no. But to the committee, yes, I was a little off. Uh, I was a little offended being a member of that committee to receive that email. Thank well, you. And, and, and not to belabor the point, but your business plan, if you knew it wasn't working, shouldn't have taken a year and a half to figure it out. We did not know it was not working until such time as we were 
um, uh, going to folks for money and they wanted a little bit more in depth as to what exactly we were using it for. We had the plan. We knew what different parts of the building were going to be used for. They wanted more in depth information, which now we're going, we're, we're right. bringing in other people. And, and again, I don't want to belabor this, but when you're, when you're putting a business plan together, if you don't have the people in line that can do and develop a proper business plan, going out to have Hussey or whoever it was go out and solicit money or look at fundraising for you, mm -hmm. to me, is putting the cart in front of the horse. I'm not saying that you guys don't have good intentions. I'm not saying that at all. I'm looking at the process. Councillor Simons, you can say what you want. I want this to work as well as anybody else does. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because it's a building that you say is old in our community and it is a beautiful building once it's repaired. How much that's going to be, who knows. But I'm trying to, all I'm trying to instill in the committee is get a decent business plan together where we can go out and solicit funds from major corporations or people interested in doing it with what a layout's going to look like, how you're going to present it, what it's going to look like to the community. That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe I was a bit crass because of the industry I come from is very crass and straightforward. All I'm trying to say is we need to get a business plan together that's going to help generate funds for the committee. That's all I was trying to say. It wasn't said to hurt anybody's feelings, to put anybody out in any way, shape, or form. And if it did, my apologies. And if you want me to speak to the committee, I'll be glad to do that too. I have no problem doing that. No, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. Any other comments or concerns? Seeing none. CAO's update, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of things here. One, um, Charles Longeway, re officially retired on January the 5th, and Russell King has been appointed as the acting director and he'll be in that role for several months and then we'll decide what the next step is moving forward. We have, um, as discussed here at this council, we have a meeting set up at the staff level for next week to explore governance options as we did with the John Noble Home and then report back to the respective councils. So, so that's where we're at with the ambulance services. And, and there were two as you recall, two initiatives, new initiatives approved in the budget. One was a new ambulance coming on. That process is, in, is started now through HR with the hiring and, and that kind of thing. And the other thing was the supervisors coming off the road and we're, we're, we're delaying that for a month or two waiting for this ambulance to come online and then we can transition into that. So we've, we have a plan to implement both those recommendations. And the other thing I wanted to say was um, further to direction from council and the shared, coming out of the shared service committee discussions, we had a meeting today, uh, my counterpart Daryl Lee from the city, uh, Gay from our, the CEO from our library system and Catherine the CEO from the Brantford library system and we talked about opportunities. We, we directed them to look at further opportunities to, to continue to work closely together and and the one um, that they all acknowledge, there's this one, I, I think the librarian for the city called it the shaggy dog. Others would call it the elephant in the room. But um, it was the fact that we do, there's not that reciprocal agreement between the city of Brantford and the county of Brant, nor does Brantford have a reciprocal agreement with any of the other library systems. And um, <clears throat> Catherine said that's, and everybody's acknowledged that that's not the norm across the province. So we're going to look at that again. And hopefully, hopefully we get, get some, some further positive shared service initiatives in that service area. So that was it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, CEO Emerson. Any questions? Councilor Coleman.
Even if Bothell can be arranged in camera to discuss the situation, seeking a second. I'll second that. We have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Or anyone like to speak to that motion? Councilor Pierce, please. No, it wouldn't meet the uh, notice requirements. No, the, the notice requirements for any special meeting is 48 hours. Do we have anything Wednesday? What do we have Wednesday? Check in to see what else we have open. Councilor Boma. Council Wheat? Yes, but going back to the CAO's comments concerning the library, there is a library board meeting tomorrow night, as well as spoke to last year. How planning tomorrow night I'm not going to attend the library and on the library board and we're putting close to those two positions approved at the budget time. And I'm well aware of the reciprocal boring agreement that city grant. Sure. Or Madam Clerk. Can I suggest maybe Monday the 15th to allow time to get a little information pulled together? Um, I'm not even sure exactly the reason for going in camera at this point, so I, I need to pull some stuff together still. And I would thank others. Okay. Mayor Eddie? There's no meetings this week. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Councilor Coleman said we, we need to have um, an in-camera meeting to discuss the issues. I guess I'm wondering, um, in-camera can only be certain things. It can be, in-camera can be legal, it can be um, information about an identifiable individual, and what else, Heather? I, I guess I'm wondering what issues is he referring to that need to have the meeting in camera? Because the clerk would need to know that. CAO Emerson has the answer for us, well, I think. Well, <laughs> one answer, but I don't know what, what Ryan's thinking exactly, but one answer could be we, we did have an in-camera discussion at the Bakke Committee meeting on Friday afternoon, and it was because we were dealing with a a, a, a contract and an identifiable individual. And I, I believe that would be part of the, the, the conversation that the council needs to have in camera too. And why I mean, do you if you want a reason to go in camera, that's, a, that's, that's certainly a part of the So the you've discussion. discussed it with Councillor Coleman already and know that he wants to, to bring that issue forward? No, I don't know that. I'm just, I, I'll repeat myself. As I introduced my comments, I said I don't know what Councillor Coleman is thinking, but I can think of one reason. Well, perhaps Councillor Coleman can tell us so that we know when we vote whether we should vote for an in-camera meeting or not. Councillor Coleman, Coleman can speak for himself. And that is we need an education session and a frank discussion on the whole damn project. Simple as that. Can't be any plainer.
We have a seconder, don't we? Yes. Everybody knows the motion. All in favor? Opposed? Madam Clerk? Um, motion's carried. Um, maybe Councillor Coleman and I can have a discussion tomorrow about scheduling an actual meeting and send some stuff out. Thank you. Motion to go on camera, please. Councillor Pierce, Councillor Boma. All in favor? Thank you. <laughs> Guess we can go in right away. Oh, maybe we can. Move to adjourn. Councillor Pierce.